The world's first COVID passport will be trialed on flights from Heathrow Airport this week. The DNI declassifies CIA memo that James Comey claimed to have no memory of receiving. And our top story, White House physician says President Donald Trump reports no COVID-19 symptoms. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Wednesday edition of Breaking News, the 7th day of October 2020. I'm Don Stewart. And if it's Wednesday, the second half of the program means it's text a question day. So if you have a question about anything we talk about here on his channel, uh, Breaking News in particular, please feel to text it. And we do our best to get as many questions answered during the second half of the program on both Wednesday and Friday. All right, let's get to our top story. White House physician, uh, Dr. Sean Conley, not to be confused with Sean Connery, I imagine, said Tuesday that the president was reporting no symptoms after returning home on Monday night after receiving treatment for the Chinese Communist Party coronavirus. This morning, the president's team of physicians met with him in the residence. The memo from uh, Conley read, he had a restful first night at home, and today he reports no symptoms. Conley said the president's vital signs and physical exam remained stable with an ambulatory oxygen saturation level between 95 and 97 percent. I assume that's very good. Overall, he continues to do extremely well, Conley said. I will provide updates as we know more. And of course, the president returned home from Walter Reed Hospital on Monday after spending the weekend for being treated for the Chinese Communist Party coronavirus. They will monitor his ongoing recovery for the next several days. Now, this again is a very very, very important story because what it points out is something we have said here for months and months and months. If people are treated right away for the Chinese Communist Party coronavirus with, with uh, certain drugs and certain procedures, uh, there's a great chance of them not being, you know, get further sick as what we saw with President Trump. And recall a couple months ago in the front of the Supreme Court on the steps there, there were a number of doctors who argued for exactly that. And of course, even though I think the Facebook uh, video of that hit 33 million or YouTube or whatever, and of course they took it off because they didn't want that to be seen around the world because it would give a, you know, an answer to the pandemic that we have and they don't want that. And so off we go. But President Trump's a live example of these things can and do work. We will keep that in mind. Tonight, of course, is the vice presidential debate between Vice President uh, Mike Pence and Kamala Harris. Should be an interesting night. Of course, we will report on that tomorrow. Now, this next story is one of these, what do we go it under? We told you so. We saw this coming, something like this. Here we go. The world's first Chinese Communist Party COVID passport will be trialed on flights from Heathrow Airport this week. The passport trials are taking place at Heathrow this week to test technology to let people travel the globe without risk of being quarantined. Passengers on United Airlines Cathay Pacific are trying out an app called the quote-unquote Common Pass. The phone software is a digital health pass, which uh, holds a cert certified COVID-19 test status in a way designed to satisfy various governments' different, different regulations. It was dreamt up by the nonprofit the Common Trust Foundation, part of the World Economic Forum, in the hope that it will end the days of flyers producing bits of paper, often in different languages. The tech is very much uh, at the trial stage, using volunteers on flights between London, New York, Hong Kong, and Singapore under government observation. But it is seen as a long-term measure to allow air travel to return to something like pre Chinese Communist Party coronavirus levels. The pass works by passengers taking a test that is done by a certified lab before uploading it to their phone. It generates a QR code that can be scanned by the airline staff and the border officials. It comes as hope for a UK airport testing breakthrough this weekend uh, that looks that was set to be dashed after ministers decided to launch another review of the issue. So it looks like this, this is going to come about. So here we go. To travel, you're going to have one of these little apps on your phone that says you have passed or you have not passed. And uh, the, the reason we are concerned about this, of course, is more and more th regulations and things we will need to be able to travel. We passed the so-called health test here. We don't have, you know, we're not contagious for the Chinese Communist Party coronavirus, theoretically, because we're, and so we can get on the plane and the other people can feel good about it. Now, I'm curious if that's the case, do people have to wear masks on the plane? Uh, do they have to social distance? Is, are there any other regulations that will be that will be there? Stay tuned. We will see what it is. But again, we're getting more and more with the government just wanting to know everything we do, 
uh, wanting to make sure wherever we go, whatever we do, that uh, they are there right in the midst, making sure we're okay, meaning they're tracking down everything we do, say, and are. All right, this next story is, I mean, it's rather, it's funny, it's sad, but it's funny. This is the DNI, the um, U.S. intelligence community. It's called the Director of National Intelligence. Okay, the Director of National Intelligence uh, put out a classified memo, or actually declassified a CA, CIA memo that says James Comey claimed to have no, memo, no memory of receiving. All right, the head of the U.S. intelligence community on April 6th declassified a referral sent from the CIA to FBI Director James Comey in 2016 last week that Comey claimed to have, well, I don't have any memory what all, of all of receiving such a thing. The three-page referral released by the Director of National Intelligence, John Ratcliffe, to members of Congress in partly redacted form, apprised Comey and FBI Assistant Deputy Assistant Director Peter Strzok stroke that intelligence suggested that Democratic presidential nominee Hillary Clinton had actually approved a plan concerning the Trump campaign and Russia's lack, alleged hack of the Democratic National Committee. In other words, Hillary was behind the whole thing, and this passed by Comey's desk. But James Comey, who claimed to have you know great memory of all things in the past when he was asked in previous uh, interviews, you know when he's up in front of Congress to kind of recap what happened at meetings. He takes copious notes, and yet 20 times during the questions, he had a memory loss. He had amnesia. I don't remember this ever coming across my desk. Really, Hillary was the one behind all this? This is a shock and news to me. And so um, since this information's been declassified, uh, of course, you can imagine, now most of the, the major media won't cover this because it, it kills their whole mantra that uh, uh, Trump-Russia collusion, but what it does show is the FBI had the evidence there, or at least had reports of this. Now, whether they're true or not, they should have followed up. Of course, they didn't follow up because they're too busy trying to get Donald Trump not elected, then once he was elected, get him out of office right away. So that story is not going to go away because Trump today has declassified a number of different materials that were related to the Russian collusion hoax and many more things will come to light and we will keep you posted. Now, another story where, again, that it's not, uh, shall we say, not surprising. Mark Zuckerberg, <clears throat> the CEO of Facebook. Zuckerberg's group funneled 99.4% of voter engagement budget to where? To Democratic districts. Surprise, surprise, surprise. A new report from Amistad Project reveals that Facebook and Google-funded Center for Technology and Civic Life's efforts to increase voting access is a front to solicit more Democratic voters. The group recently received $250 million from Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg, and the significant majority of the sum has been funneled to where? Democratic districts. In other words, this is a kind of a get out the vote thing. Facebook has made a big deal. We're going to get people out to vote. We're going to, we want everybody to participate in the election. So where do they funnel the money to get people out to vote? Well, according to this, 99.4% uh, of the voter engagement budget went to districts. There are people who live in Democratic districts, so they'll get out and vote democratically. According to the Amistad Project, the 17 cities and counties that received the largest grants from CTCL, totaling more than $51 million, combined with just $300,000 given to Republican-leaning uh, counties. So in other words, here we go. Uh, they've got to the Democratic-leaning counties $51 million, to the, Demo the Republican-leaning counties to get out and vote less than 300000 And they go through a list of the top counties receiving the money. And so the bottom line is this shows how the activism here on Facebook is attempting, again, to fix the results of the election. We saw that. Remember, we talked about this so many times. Google, they had the meeting right after Trump won in 2016. The one that was recorded, that was the recording surreptitiously that was released. And the Google leaders said, we can't have that happen again. we got to make sure he doesn't win in 2020. So they're doing everything they can to stop Donald Trump from winning re-election. And one of the things they're doing is get out the vote. Get out the vote. As long as you live in a Democratic district, then you vote. Republican district, stay home, watch it on TV. Anyway, so that's what we're, uh, we're seeing. Now, the next story is not surprising either. Almost 95% of the Silicon Valley donations have gone to who? To Joe Biden, of course. A recent report from Wired magazine states that almost 95% of donations from employees at Silicon Valley tech giants went to Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden. 
Donations to Biden from the employees of big tech companies have been doubled to those of Hillary Clinton in 2016. In other words, we're not going to make the same mistake we did last time. We're going to make sure our guy gets in. Okay, a recent report from Wired states that 95% of donations from employees working at Silicon Valley tech giants such as Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, and Oracle went to Democratic presidential co uh, nominee Joe Biden over President Donald Trump. Wired reports that employees in the tech firm have contributed 20 times as much money to Biden as to Trump since the start of 2019. So they're not only giving money to Joe Biden's campaign, Facebook is making sure only the Democrats get out and vote, you know, when they send the get out the vote uh, messages there on Facebook to uh, counties that have a great uh, Democratic majority. <clears throat> Employees at Alphabet are Biden's biggest financial backers in Silicon Valley, according to the filings, donating almost $1.8 million to his campaign. This accounts for more than one-third of the money raised from employees of the other six companies. According to the campaign finance watchdog Open Secrets, contributions from Alphabet employees and political action committees collectively exceed those from any other company. And Open Secrets claims that Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and Apple account for five of the seven largest donors to the Biden campaign on that basis. Surprise, surprise, surprise. So Silicon Valley... The tech industry is, is, was for Hillary Clinton, big time for Joe Biden, thinking they can uh, swerve the election his way. Well, we're less than four weeks away. We will see. We will see. It was four weeks from yesterday is the election. So four weeks from today will be the day after. And the Lord help us all on the day after, I imagine. All right. Now, again, here we've got another story that fits the same mantra. This is from the Daily Caller. It's, a, again, Daily Caller website. The editor says, Google won't let you see our article even if you search it, even if you search for it by name. This is to the place where we've gotten to with Google in particular as a search engine. The Daily Caller is a conservative uh, website, and now they're saying this. Well, we'll read you the story. Editor-in-Chief Jeffrey Ingersoll on Thursday showed Google hid a Daily Caller article this last Thursday about the World Health Organization's abortion advocacy and its search results. Searches of the article's exact title place it on pages that statistically no one ever clicks on, while articles that present pro-abortion perspectives come up first instead. So let's just kind of summarize what this was all about. Daily Caller did an article uh, showing the WHO, World Health Organizations, they, you know, they're advocating abortion on demand worldwide, all right? And they were responding to that. So if you want to find a title that, that, that shows that WHO is pushing abortion on demand worldwide, you can't find it. It's not there. You will go to where statistically down the list in the search engines, you and I will never look. And if you click on the, the title of the article from, from Daily Caller, you'll get something just the opposite there. You'll get a, a, a pro-abortion perspective that comes up first instead. So this is crazy in terms of, of Google uh, suppression in light of the news in the New York Times that the WHO is basically full of it, the uh, writer wrote. In April, WHO took a few minutes to remind the world uh, how helpful abortion would be during the pandemic. And uh, Daily Caller said we covered it straight up and down, and we wanted to let you know that, but you'd never know because you cannot find it, even if you type in the name, because if you type in the exact name of the article from the Daily Caller, it won't take you there. It'll take you to something teaching just the opposite, because that's what Google attempts to do. That's what Facebook is doing, Amazon, Twitter, YouTube, the whole bit. According to Ingersoll, even when fed exact phrases and quotes from the article, including just the headline and the SEO an SEO headline, Google search engine doesn't display the caller's article earlier than at least page 10. You have to get to at least page 10 to even to see it. The Federalists found a similar search result using different browsers and search histories, placing the exact title in quotes to mark, uh, to, to mark the search for, and specifically did not pull up the article on the first page of Google search results. So here we go again. <laughs> Surprise, 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 right? Google does not want you to see articles that go against their point of view, their mantra. They want uh, Joe Biden to win. They want the Democrats to take over. They want to see a control um, in the, um, you know, government of the United States of people, where it's just real simple. There will be a, um, shall we say, across the board, some type of censorship for anybody who wants to have a different point of view. It's not the old days where we'll put every view up and you can 
view each one? Oh no, the only one you can view is the one we say is right, we say is correct, and this is exactly what they're doing to try and fix the results of the election. Will they succeed? Well, stay tuned. We will know in a few weeks. Now, I had an article here I've been wanting to get to, and it, it really is uh, kind of you know on point. It's called Lockdown, the New Totalitarianism. And it's sort of what we've been saying off and on, but I like the way this article puts it. We'll read a little bit for, about it. Every political ideology has three elements. A vision of hell with the enemy that needs to be crushed, a vision of a more perfect world, and the plans for transitioning from one to the other. This means the transition usually involves the takeover and deployment of society's most powerful tool, the state. For this reason, ideologies tend to be totalitarianism. In other words, tend to be ones where the state would uh, have absolute control. They depend fundamentally on overriding people's preferences and choices and replacing them with the scripted and planned beliefs and behaviors. An obvious case, of, of course, is communism. Capitalism is the enemy, while worker control and the end of private property is the heaven, and the means to achieve the goal is violent expropriation. Socialism is often a softer version of the same. Uh, you get there through piecemeal economic planning. In other words, and let's remind you of this again, uh, capitalism is the enemy, worker control, while well, worker control and the end of private property is the heaven. Most people don't realize this, but under a socialistic, Marxist, communistic system, whatever you want to call it, you don't own private property anymore. The government owns everything. They tell you where you can live, what you can have. That is the total control that they have. You want to protest? Great. You can't because no one's going to listen. There's no outlet that will, you know, <laughs> will play your protest or let you promote it, whether you know, on a, a television program, whether in an article or something like that. It's all just a one mind uh, you know, point of view. Uh, we see this, of course, in uh, Xi Jinping's China now. 1.4 billion people get the same message every day, day in, day out. Anybody tries to put something else up, they're, you know, censored. They're taken, you know, they're not seen on the Internet as though there aren't any more points of view. And so the lockdown now, as the um, article is saying, is a new type of totalitarianism. And basically it's an ideology. And so the, the person is calling it lockdownism. It's a its vision of, of hell is a society with pathogens run freely. It's heaven when a society is managed entirely by what medical technocrats whose main job is the suppression of all disease, the mental focus is on the viruses and other bugs, and the anthropology is to regard all human beings as little more a sacks than sacks of deadly pathogens. In other words, all right, the lockdown, what it's supposed to do now is make sure everyone is healthy all the time and because we're the carriers, the causes of the diseases, we have to be locked down not to spread it to others. Well, unfortunately, for this point of view or whatever you want to call it, from the day one when the human race fell into sin, we've had diseases. We've had viruses. We will continue to. That's the nature of the beast in this fallen world. People will get sick. They will die of that. The body is not meant to last forever. Old age will creep in and things won't work as well. And that's just who we are, how we've been created. We were created perfectly, but the Bible says very clearly we fell from that perfect creation. Genesis chapter 3, when sin entered into the world, and as God warned uh, Adam in the garden, uh, the day you eat of this fruit, dying you will die, the Hebrew says, you shall surely die. The death process will begin at that time, and that happens to each and every one of us. The moment we're born, we begin to age and begin to die, believe it or not, looking at it that particular way. And so uh, under socialism, totalitarianism, we're going to try and stop this. We're going to, you know, or at least impede it to some degree. And it's as though the most important thing we can all have is this semi-good health. And the best way to get it is what? By staying away from other people. But see, that's not how we live. That's not how we prosper. But that is how we are being controlled. And we've told you story after story. We continue to, where the authorities in certain states, particularly here in California, are acting as though... Uh, well, they are. They're trying to control every aspect of our lives. You have to wear a mask everywhere outside. You can't go to these types of businesses or those types. These are non-essential businesses. The others may be. And, of course, uh, they will decide when it's okay for you and I to do certain things. When it's not or it turns the other direction, they will say, okay, we're going to have to lock you down again. And we've got not only that here in California, but particularly true, the mess that's going on right now, as we mentioned, in the U.K. that is just one 
big cabal that's there. Uh, Scotland did a lockdown today, a very draconian one, and Boris Johnson may follow. We'll be, we'll be dealing with that this week, but it looks like a long-term thing. We're, we're seeing this happen in other parts of the country and other parts of the world, so not surprising. Um, so this is how they control, by just locking us down and saying, you know, we've got to keep you, we're trying to keep you safe. No, they're not. They're trying to keep the economy stifled. So it looks like we need another president to come in and make it right and make it better. All right. Uh, from a top Italian epidemiologist, he says, wearing masks outdoor, the outdoor mask law is simply wrong. Love it when you have people say something like this. The president is from Rome. The president of the Italian Society for Anti-Infection Therapy, the SITA, said Tuesday's Italy's new decree mandating outdoor mask wearing is a mistake. Dr. Matteo Bassetti, who is also the director of infectious diseases at the San Martino Hospital in Genoa, said that the Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte decision to impose outdoor masks on the national level has no basis in science. The use of masks only makes sense in confined spaces where it is not possible to have certainty and guarantee of the necessary physical distancing or outdoors when you can't maintain physical distancing, he wrote on his Facebook page. I have tried to look for scientific evidence on the use of outdoor masks and their potential benefits for virus transmission, but could find none. Well, really, no kidding. And so uh, remember the stories we've done. We've been a couple of them, and they're there all the time. Here's some guy out, you know, the beach is close, some guy's out on the beach by himself, and there's nobody around. And because he's not wearing a mask, he's arrested. Uh, there was one young lady in, in uh, where was it, Spain, who was a lifeguard, and she was um, put on leave because she had the Chinese Communist Party coronavirus, but she decided to go surfing. Now, she's going surfing out there by herself. There's not anybody around her, but because she went and when she's so-called so contagious, even though, what, is she going to give the sharks the virus? What, what's going on? She was arrested. They show her being handcuffed and dragged off. Why? Because they can. And one of the, the, the saddest ones was from, I don't know if it's Bondi Beach, one of the beaches in Australia in Sydney, um, where there was a, a guy that didn't have a mask on. He was there sunning on the beach, and it took 10 Aussie policemen to arrest the guy and take him away, all to the booing and screaming of the crowd on what the police were doing at that time, as though they had nothing better to do than arrest some poor bloke who was out there trying to sun himself and didn't want to wear a mask, and so they take him away, and, you know, I guess he was putting up a bit of a, uh, a hassle there. But uh, this, is, this is the world you and I live in. Why do they do it? Because they can, and we've seen leaders, particularly mayors of certain cities, governors of certain states, acting as though they are, you know, they are the, uh, you know, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, making them bow down to the golden statue there. And so this epidemi epidemiologist from Italy said, wait a minute, wearing it outside these masks, this is wrong. There's no basis, there's no health advantage whatsoever for this. Why are you doing this? And they're doing it, why? Because they can, and because the government uh, makes the call and they're allowing it, and so that's where we're at. Now, another very um, sad story comes out of St. Louis, Missouri. The, a grand jury invited that St. Louis couple who used guns to hold off the protesters. A grand jury inv indicted Mark and Patricia McCloskey on Tuesday on charges related to their 20, June 28, 2020 use of guns to keep protesters away from their home. Uh, KS, a KSDK reports that the grand jury indicted them uh, on exhibiting a weapon and tampering with the evidence. Breitbart News reported that Mark held an AR-15 and Patricia had a handgun on June 28th in hopes of deterring protesters from damaging their home and property. The video of the couple standing outside their home went viral. I remember the picture. Here's a couple. He's holding an AR-15. She's got a handgun. Uh, the Black Lives Matter protesters broke in to their gated community, walked over a hedge, and they've got like a million dollar house there, a hedge, you know, as you start getting in the yard, coming towards their house. Well, they were fearful for what might happen, the damage for their own safety. He pulls out a gun, and she has a gun, and says, you know, get away, and the people left. So what do they do? Well, the district attorney there, in her great wisdom, decides to charge and bring, be put before a grand jury, the McCloskeys, for defending their own property. Um, it, the investigation was open two days uh, after this event took place, the New York Post quoted St. Louis Pro prosecutor Kimberly Gardner saying, I am alarmed at the events that occurred over the weekend where peaceful protesters were met by guns. 
peaceful protesters that, again, break into a gated community. They're trespassing, number one. Number two, they come on the, this, the yard of this, this couple. Uh, number three, they, hop, they go hop over a small hedge to move towards the house. There's your peaceful protesters for you. Uh, she added, we must protect the right to peacefully protest. Any attempt to chill it through intimidation or threat of deadly force must not be tolerated. But the Hill reported Missouri Governor Mike Parson, Republican, believe that the McCloskeys did that which was lawful and they did what they should legally should do. Here's what he said, and amen to this. A mob does not have the right to charge your property. They have every right to protect themselves. He suggested that he would pardon the McCloskeys if they are charged for their use of firearms. He uh, used a tweet July 18, 2020 to say, we will not allow law-abiding citizens to be targeted for exercising their constitutional rights. And again, just think about it for a second. What would you do if you, you know, they're, they're, they're very successful lawyers, they've got a nice place, gated community, they've worked hard for the money, you know, they've earned it, and all of a sudden, the gates of the gated community become open. You've got all these people coming in, the, the protesters, the, whatever you want to call them, rioters, Black Lives Matter people, and they're a you know, quite a raucous group of people, and but they come straight for your house, they go on your yard, hop over your small little hedge, and start moving right towards your house. Now, would you maybe feel a little bit intimidated by something like that? Well, of course you would, because you don't know what they're up to. Now, again, they may have gotten on the people in McCloskey's yard and took a knee and just peacefully protested, sang Kumbaya or something like that. Or they may have done some physical damage, as we've seen on 48 out of the 50 cities cities in the United States, 40 out of 50 most populated cities, there have been riots taking place where there was physical damage done to the parts of the city simply because the protesters are not merely peaceful protesters, they were there to riot. And well, some of them were anyway, and they do riot, they destroy property. And so here you've got, there's the arch there in St. Louis, Missouri, and it's a very sad, sad story. So we'll keep an eye on that. But uh, it's really kind of shocking, isn't it? It sends a chill because here you have people that, you know, you can't blame for being fearful of their life. They're watching on TV and seeing protests everywhere, seeing Minneapolis, Seattle, Portland, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, New York. You know, you've seen protesters burn down buildings, destroy businesses, uh, light fires, you know, set fires and this, and then, you know, physically attack certain people. You don't know what's going to happen there. And particularly, this was not, this is private property they're on. This is not like on the street where you've got a, a business there on Main Street and they're on the sidewalk. They happen to turn right, right into your business. This is a gated community, which is, uh, again, only the owners and the people they allow on can get on the on the grounds. There's no trespassing allows. These people were trespassing. They were breaking the law to begin with, and yet the DA from St. Louis didn't seem to be bothered by something like that. Yeah, we can peaceful protest. We don't care if you go and break into someone's gated community. You go on their own private property. You jump over a little hedge and you start moving right towards their door. All the while, by Lord knows what you're chanting or protesting. Um, and how dare you think about defending yourself. Now, I wonder what would have happened if the McCloskeys didn't have their firearms out. What would have happened to them? Thankfully, we'll never find out because they did protect themselves. But um, again, in their minds, as you can imagine, in your mind, it'd be the same thing, too. We don't want this outcome to be, you know, what it could possibly be. Who knows? Maybe, again, maybe they would be peaceful. We don't know that, but maybe they wouldn't. And what kind of responsible person would, you know, not protect his family, his property, uh, when he sees people coming on, breaking the law, coming into their own community? So anyway, that's a story we've... Um, We've covered a few times here on Breaking News. We'll keep it in, in mind. But remember, Bible says at the time of the end, there'll be two major, 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 major uh, things going on. Lawlessness and violence. The Lord Jesus talked about that at the time of the end. And so we expect to see more and more of that. Here's what we've seen, particularly in 2020, here in the United States of America. All right, halfway through already, this uh, very busy Wednesday edition of Breaking News. When we come back... Yes, we will take your questions. You've got the number there on the uh, screen. If you want to text a question, we'll do our best to answer it. So we'll be back in about two minutes to answer them. So as always, please don't go wandering off. Unlocking the end time prophetic puzzle. World events continue to point to the near return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Unlocking the end time prophetic puzzle world event brings together some of today's most sought-after speakers, including Donald Perkins, Ed Hinson, 
Mark Hitchcock, and Don Stewart. This complete DVD set, recorded live, is our exclusive gift this October for any donation of $20 or more. You can help his channel broadcast the good news of Jesus Christ 24 hours a day. Become a family co-laborer today. Yes, you can help us change the lives of the lost. Simply go to hischannel.com, click the donation link, or send your tax-deductible gift to His Channel, Post Office Box 25, Santa Ana, California, 92702. His Channel, teaching the gospel on listener-supported television. All right, we're back to the second half of Breaking News on this Wednesday edition. It is the 7th day of October 2020. I'm Don Stewart, and Wednesday and Friday after, I don't know, say afternoon, the second half of the program, it's not after, well, it's maybe afternoon where you're at, but it's uh, after the middle of the hour, where we deal with your questions that you ask. And we're so thankful you sent them in. I enjoy this time immensely. We supposedly, uh, you do too, we hear a lot of great things about it from you, so we will continue to do that. So let's get right to it. All right, Logan has the first question today. Uh, if the streets go, are the streets of gold in the river of life after the rapture? Uh, in, in the new, is it in the New Jerusalem or right after the rapture? Is the river that proceeds from the throne literal or is it symbolic? No, it's Revelation chapter 21, Logan. It's not after the rapture. It's after actually the, what's well, after the rapture, but after the end of the millennium. There's a thousand year period of peace on earth after that time. And then we're told in Revelation 21, New heaven and new earth come down, the new Jerusalem down on a, uh, uh, you know, it comes on a foundation. So we believe it's on the new earth, the remade new heavens and new earth at that particular time. And as it describes, there is a river that does proceed from the throne. Is it literal or symbolic? It's a great question. And you got commentators, you know, arguing for both. But, you know, whenever you, see, you read something like this, there's no reason it couldn't be literal because it shows, you know, water represents life. You've got the tree of life that, you know, they'll be there in the um, New Jerusalem showing the life of God is there in the midst of the people. The water will continually flow. In the uh, scriptures, you have many, many passages that talk about, you know, water, how life-giving it is. And it seems to be something literal as a reminder to us all that for all eternity, there'll be fresh water, fresh life that each and every one of us get from the throne of the living God. Won't that be a wonderful thing to see? Can't wait. So, Logan, great, great question. All right, next question here from Anonymous. After Jesus' death, people came out of the grave and walked around. Who were those people? Did they go back to... Uh, or, or, or uh, to the grave, or do they go to heaven? Now, this is interesting question. It's one that often comes up. It's from Matthew 27, and it's unique to Matthew. Now, we need to understand something here. Matthew was writing directly to the Jews. He was basically showing that Jesus is the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. So he starts with the, uh, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, son, son of Abraham. First mention, name mentioned is David, where the Messiah, Second Chronicles uh, uh, 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 19, says the Messiah will come from the line of David. So everything in Matthew's gospel is to show Jesus is the promised Messiah, where you've got him, you know, virgin conception, you've got the magi, the wise men coming, bearing him gifts. Over and over again, he's called Emmanuel, God with us. And so everything there it shows that Jesus was the fulfillment of what the law and the prophets said during the Old Testament. Now, another thing the law and the prophets taught, when the Messiah comes, people will be raised from the dead. And that's why unique to Matthew is this record at Jesus' death where certain people came out of the graves and appeared to many folks in Jerusalem. Now, this seems to be a local, uh, and what we call here, not a resurrection, it would be called a reanimation, or uh, basically the reanimated to life. In other words, they, have, they, they haven't received the glorified body. They're in the grave, they, they're dead, they're reanimated where they come back to life, but in the same body that was placed in the grave, and they appeared for a time being, and then they went back. You know, where they died again. What happened to them, we just don't know. It seems to be a local occurrence, only mentioned again by Matthew, not by the other three gospel writers, to indicate another one of the miracles uh, that 
took place around the cross of Jesus Christ at Calvary. Many none of the miracles happened. Remember, there's an earthquake that took place. There was, uh, you know, and then again after that, the graves were open. We're told in Matthew's gospel. So now they uh, they went back to the grave. Well, they died again. Uh, whether they went back right away or whatever, we're not told. We don't know, but we do know this: for the Jewish reader, when they would read that, say, "Well, yeah, this is another sign of the Messiah." The dead would be raised, and again, at Jesus' death, these people uh, got up and uh, met and talked to some of the people in Jerusalem. Okay, in the millennium, this is our same questionnaire, uh, anonymous, I heard we will rule with Christ over the people that live through the tribulation. But it sounds like in the tribulation, if you deny the Antichrist, you will have your head removed. So who, re who survives the tribulation? Well, that's, you know, that's a great question. You will. You will have your head removed as it will, but not everybody dies during that particular time. You will indeed, uh, indeed be, uh, in the great tribulation period, someone who is uh, you know, basically marked out by this final Antichrist as one who will... Uh, take your life if you don't take the mark of the beast. Now, there will be people who escape it. How they do it, we don't know. They'll escape the mark of the beast. And so they um, they will survive the millennium, because uh, excuse me, the tribulation. Because remember, Matthew 25 says at the end, you got the nations gathered, uh, the sheep and the goats. The sheep on the right side, the goats on the left. The sheep are believers, the goats are unbelievers. These people have all survived this very terrible period. There are believers and unbelievers that survive. The survivors or the believers go into the millennium. All right. Uh, good question there. All right. Um, this one here now, this one came in by email. Uh, Dennis sent it to me. I want to deal with this. There's a couple of questions here. We've actually uh, gone through them in the past, uh, but uh, there's always new viewers, and so it's always a new question to the person that asks. I heard that on your show you said the U.S. and China aren't mentioned in the final battle. What about the 200 million man army? Okay, in Revelation 9 there's a 200 million man army that gathers there. Um, don't believe that's the same as the kings from the east in Revelation 16. There are two different contexts there. Whether it's a literal army or whether it's symbolic uh, there, it's, you know, it's, a, it's open for question. The kings from the east in Revelation 16, it is possible there it's talking about China because it says they come from the rising of the sun. Now, again, from the vantage point of the nation Israel at that time, the rising of the sun wouldn't be in what we call the Far East. There would be closer places in the Middle East there where they could come from. It, and it, but it could be. It could very well be China. It may not. But we don't want to conflate or put together Revelation 9, the 200 million man army, with Revelation 16, the kings from the east coming and gathering at that particular time at the end. So that's why we say something like that. So, great question. Also, I know that it, as it was in the days of Noah, can this mean the Nephilim will be rampant? All right, we need to answer this question. It's been a while since we had that. In Genesis chapter 6, we're talking about the preview before the flood. And the Bible des uh, describes what the world was like before the flood. And again, two things, lawlessness and violence were rampant. And then we're told in the first part of Genesis chapter 6, the Nephilim were on, in the world those days and afterwards there. Now, the, the, the question is, who are the, the Nephilim? Nephilim actually is a Hebrew word that is transliterated, meaning it's not translated. Some translations read giants, some translations read other things. Uh, Nephilim is what the Hebrew word says, and they don't translate it because we're really not sure what the word means. It may become uh, from the Hebrew verb nephal, which is meaning the fallen ones. We don't know. But we know this, the Nephilim were there before the flood and afterwards. Numbers 13, 33, they're there also. And so the question is, who are they? All right, we've uh, talked about this before, but again, we've got new viewers every day, so it's fair to ask the question again. The Nephilim were human beings. They were not fallen angels. The fallen angel view is popular, but it doesn't fit the scripture. There's so many problems with that. And I would encourage you, if you want to uh, you know, investigate or see what the problems are, one of the uh, books I have on my website, recall on educatingourworld.com, that is my website, where you can download any one of the 58 or all of the 58 books that I've written where it says download books. We have a book called Under the Unseen World, uh, Evil Angels, Demons, and the Occult. Evil Angels, Demons, and the Occult is the title of the book. And there is an appendix there, a 58-page appendix, where we go into this question in great detail. And we show, I believe, beyond any doubt, that the Nephilim are human beings. They're not fallen angels for many, 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 many reasons. So the, we don't want to think that there'll be some 
type of half human, half angels running around at this time? I don't believe it's biblically possible for a number of reasons. But again, another great question here. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Another good question. It's Poppy. Okay, we got a name here. Hi, Poppy. What is the best way to witness to my good friend who is Jewish? Are there certain scriptures I should mention? How do I, as the Bible says, provoke her to jealousy? Great, great question. All right. Um, what you want to do, Poppy, there's really not one way to witness to anybody. Um, everybody's different. What we don't want to be is kind of a spiritual dispenser, thinking, all right, uh, this is question 32, now this is number 19. Now, we, we need to find out the person, where they're coming from. What I would do, she's your friend, you, may, you start by asking certain questions. You know, have you heard, you know, what do you know about Jesus? Are you interested in that? You know, and, and maybe give your own testimony here, and then you can uh, drill down from there. It's amazing how many people don't know anything about Jesus. They're ignorant. And what you can do is share what Jesus has done in your life. He's, you know, changed you, given you an identity, a purpose, a destiny. But also, too, that he fulfilled Old Testament predictions, Old Testament prophecies. And the book I just referred to, the Gospel of Matthew, would be a good one to share with your Jewish friends. Say, so, you know, here's what's really interesting. In the first century, there was one of the four Gospel writers named Matthew, who was a customs official, a tax collector, who basically was writing to people like you, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what he did from the very beginning is show that Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled many predictions with respect to the coming of the Messiah, born in the family of David, born in the city of Bethlehem, uh, you know, supernaturally conceived, God with us, followed by a forerunner. And you go on and on and on and on with that. You might want to try something like that because Matthew's gospel was written specifically to Jewish people in Jesus' day and beyond who knew the Old Testament, knew the predictions, knew the prophecies, and Matthew was showing that Jesus was the one who fulfilled that. So very, very good question. <clears throat> okay, Emily from California. Do you believe there's a possible connection with the hand and the forehead temperature checks to which is discussed in Revelation? Are we being groomed for what is to come in the tribulation period? Well, yeah, Emily, the people are being groomed, not we. We're not going to be here if we're Bible believers, believers in Christ. That's for the uh, unbelievers to start it out where the wrath of God is coming on. But all the things that are happening, I, I don't know so much about the right hand and the forehead with the mark of the beast is that the temperature checks are necessarily reminiscent of that. But, you know, you, you, you do check you, the pulse usually here on the right hand. The forehead, of course, you, we're all used to now, we, we probably should be if we're not, of someone shooting a little, uh, you know, thermometer at us and seeing if we've got a fever or not. The temperature checks. Um, it's just, it, it is setting the stage. It's grooming the world for, um, you know, some type of uh, identification mark, which will be, of course, according to the Bible, either on the forehead or on the right hand. And so not surprising this is taking place. It's one of many things that are going on. But like we talked about the first part of the program, the real problem is the lockdown, locking us down, uh, supposedly for our own good, because we want to rid the world of a virus. Well, we've had viruses around from the beginning, and we're going to continue to have them around. And this particular one, like we have mentioned, is not any more, it's, it's very contagious, that, but not any more deadly than other viruses of the past. In fact, a lot less deadly than other COVID viruses, such as SARS, which killed some 10% of the people that got that, such as the MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory System. Now, fortunately, they killed 32.5% of the people that got it. Fortunately, very few people got it because it was very difficult to get. SARS killed about 8,000 people out of 80,000 who, who contacted, contracted it. But uh, this thing is, everybody's gotten it. You know, just like the, the virus, the flu that comes along every year, everybody, uh, you know, seems to get it. Now, some people have antibodies in their system for, for some reason. They don't get it or they get a very slight, uh, you know, uh, Part, uh, they participate in a slight fever or whatever it might be. And like we have said, uh, we made it very clear, President Trump, here he comes in on a last Friday. He's got a fever. He needs oxygen. He's not doing well. They start treating him with certain, you know, um, drugs, certain uh, types of procedures that have been recommended, many of them that are experimental, many of them that we've had people say these could never work. And what happens? And a few days later, here we are Wednesday of the next week, he's back at the White House, been back since Monday, seemed to be doing pretty good, still monitored. So this is one of the things that we've been trying to scream from day one here, that many doctors have tried to say the same thing. If you get this thing right away, as soon as someone tests positive or has a fever, you start treating them a certain way, the chances are you can you know, nip the old thing in the bud right away. 
And this has been true in many, many cases. Unfortunately, that has not been promoted very wide because the lockdown is one of the reasons people are, want to control us. All right, that is the government. All right, why did the Jews not recognize the time of their visitation, Luke 1944? That's a great question. Uh, one of the things that Jesus did, this is on Palm Sunday. Remember, he comes down Palm Sunday Road, and he, um, he cries over the city of Jerusalem. And he says, one of the reasons you're going to be judged is because you didn't recognize the time of your visitation. And the time of the visitation, can, you can look at it one of two ways. Either the whole coming of the Messiah, you know, uh, you know he, he fulfilled the different prophecies. He was, you know, healed the sick, raised the dead. He performed the miracles. Like we talked about earlier in Matthew, he had the uh, credentials. He was from the family line of David, born in the right place, born in the right time. But they still didn't believe. You know, he, he did everything he could do, but people still didn't believe. So at this particular day, when he came down on Palm Sunday Road, the first time he he allowed himself to be worshipped publicly. Uh, some people argue that this was the exact day where Daniel 9 tells us that, you know, the 70, we did this a couple weeks ago when we did our uh, Saturday conference here. In fact, I was the one that spoke on this subject of the whole 77s, the 70 sets of seven, or the 490 years. And we're told in Daniel, after a certain prediction, excuse me, after a certain, uh, well, proclamation was made, a certain order that was made to allow the people to come back and rebuild the city of Jerusalem, there would be 483 years to that, and after 483 years, the Messiah would be on the scene. The Messiah would be on the earth. And we talked about that. There's two ways of looking at it, depending on what date, what is your starting date, either 457 or 444 B.C., and bottom line is, uh, each of us takes us to some time in the, in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, where there's his baptism, where there's his triumphal entry. But the bottom line was, you, you do the 483 years from these uh, future um, uh, decrees by uh, the kings there, and all of a sudden, yeah, he just happens to be on the scene during that time, and we say happens. wasn't by coincidence, it's what was predicted. So it's possible he's talking about this very day you should have been waiting for me, because this is the fulfillment of the 483 years of Daniel chapter 9. Either way, what Jesus was saying is <clears throat> he did everything that the Messiah was supposed to do, heal the sick, raise the dead, perform miracles. In fact, we read in Matthew chapter 12, <clears throat> this really, really interesting event where there was a man who was demon-possessed, was also blind and, and I was mute, couldn't speak, couldn't see, and he's demon-possessed. And the Lord Jesus cast out the demon, and he healed him where the man could see again and could speak again. Now, the people, the crowd, marveled at that. They couldn't believe what they'd seen. And so you can picture the situation. The religious leaders are sitting there, you know, with their arms folded like this. Jesus performs the miracle. I'm sure their jaws drop. So the crowd looks, sees them, sees this man being healed by Jesus. And I'm sure as a, in mass, they all turned to the religious leaders and did something like, okay, what's this all about? Fascinatingly, the religious leaders had, you know, they had to respond because they just saw a miracle. So what did they do? They attributed the miracles of Jesus to the devil. In other words, it's, it's, yeah, he did a miracle, but it's Beelzebub, the prince of the demons, that did it. They could not deny the miracles of Jesus. They just attributed what he did as to and from the devil himself. And so what we see uh, in, um, we got Mike and Brad here today. Good to see you guys back. They'll be back today, by the way. They had that trial. I'm sure we're going to tell you about it uh, in about, you uh, know, 12 minutes, it looks like, and so please stay tuned for them. Anyway, um, what happened was with the religious leaders, they, they couldn't deny the miracles, and they just tried to attribute it to the devil. What's really interesting, as far as we know, in the first 500 years of the Christian church, first five centuries, every account that's come down to us about Jesus from either friend or foe, every single account has him doing miracles. Now, the unbelievers tried to explain it away like the religious leaders did, but with, by him doing it from the, with the power of the devil. But they could not deny the miracles of Jesus. In fact, remember on Acts chapter 2 when Peter's talking there on the day of Pentecost. Now, can you imagine this? Uh, they have this miraculous thing happen. There's, the disciples start speaking in languages they'd never learned before in various dialects, various uh, people that gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover and the Feast of, Feast of Pentecost from all over the Roman Empire. They hear the gospel preaching their own dialect, their unique dialect of the Roman Empire. What's this? They're all, they're all gathered together. They hear the mighty works of God. 
And at this particular time, Peter says, this is, this is a miracle of God, but it's pointing to you the power of God. And then he goes on to preach the gospel of Christ. And he said, Jesus of Nazareth, who himself is a miracle worker, just as you yourselves know. Now, can you imagine you're speaking to an audience that just 50 days earlier, the religious leaders crucified this person, this person, you know, for, for whatever reason, you know, they, they trumped up charges against him. Peter says, just as you yourselves know, this man performed miracles. Now, let's face it. If Jesus Christ were not a miracle worker, the sermon would have ended right there. Everybody would have left. They said, what do you mean as we know? What are you talking about? The fact that they listened to Peter tells us something that they certainly knew that Jesus was a miracle worker. And I'm sure many in the audience probably would have touched their eyes. Yeah, once I was blind and now I see another person. Yeah, my hand was withered. Now it works again. Of course I know he's a miracle worker. So that that was Peter's introduction. The miracle, of the, the, the languages they were able to speak in the various dialects, and reminding them that Jesus himself was a miracle worker during his time on the earth. <clears throat> what do you say who someone who believes in aliens? Is there scripture regarding this? Now, alien, do you mean like Canadians coming across the border? No, probably not. You mean people from other, other planets, right? Is there scripture regarding this? Well, here's the thing. We live in a universe that um, is very vast, very wide, and the Bible tells us there is other life besides life here on planet Earth. There is other life in our, in our universe. Now, we've got God, he's alive. We have various heavenly beings, uh, the angels, the seraphim, the cherubim, various heavenly beings that, that exist in a world we cannot see. You know, it's the invisible world. And then there's uh, evil beings there, demons, Satan and his minions there. They are there. But the question usually is, all right, besides that, you know, again, unbelievers don't believe in this, but is there anything else out there besides us, besides human beings? And the answer is the Bible is concerned about what happens here on planet Earth and tells us specifically, this is what's going on on this planet. Here's who we have to be worried about, the, the, uh, the demons, you know, Satan and that. There's good angels looking after us. There's God himself. Now, besides that, the subject really isn't broached. It really isn't talked about. So theoretically, there could be other civilizations out there somewhere, another dimension. We, we don't know. Um, one thing we're told in Ephesians chapter 2 in the ages to come, he's going to reveal his greatness and that he, he could have done that before. We just simply don't know because the Bible's concerned with this universe here, right here. In the beginning, God created the universe. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1. the universe by definition, everything that there is. Was there something before that? There could have been. We don't know. We're not, we're not told about it. The scripture does not mention anything about it. There's no pre-Adamic human beings, anything like that. But here's another thing. Um, when the Lord tells us about this final seven-year period, the Great Tribulation, we're told this final Antichrist and his cohort, the false prophet, do signs and lying wonders. And many people have speculated, well, maybe he's going to claim, because this Antichrist, the first beast there, going to claim to be God himself, uh, you may have something like that. You know, this false prophet says, you know, this is actually a, a personage who is from another planet, another place, and somewhere in another galaxy far, far away or whatever, who is actually uh, a god or the god who you need to worship, and he will force you to worship him, as well as the devil, too, that will be worshiping uh, Satan at the same time. And so, you know, it's not impossible at that particular time they could make the claim that this person comes from, you know, is a Romulan or a Klingon or something like that or some other place out in the universe. Who knows? Uh, but um, there are people that want to believe something like that because, let's face it, we don't want to believe we're the only people here in the universe. We don't want to believe we're all alone. We want to believe some type of, like C.S. Lewis used to say, uh, we want to believe that some type of God is there in control of all things. But not the nasty God of the Bible, as Lewis says, most unbelievers don't want to believe. It's kind of like the old gentleman up there that kind of looks at us and kind of winks at us and it's okay, we can get away with whatever we want. Uh, not the God of the Bible that, like Lewis says, that they don't want to believe in who is, will judge sin. But at least they feel secure that there's something up there who is watching over us in such a way, but letting us run our own way, and of course, allows us to be who we are. Well, again, the Bible is a different portrait of God. There is one God who created the universe, 
created and sustains it, but he is not winking at sin. He, is, he did something about it by sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for the sins of the world some 2,000 years ago so you and I could have that right relationship with God. So the point of, of, of all this is that, you know, the Bible talks about uh, there are there is other life. We're not alone in the universe. That's the point, okay? But whether it be aliens, as, you know, we see in these various movies and something like that, do they exist? Well, there's no real evidence for that to this date. Uh, a lot of people have made claims, but no real objective evidence. So we'll have to leave it at that right now. But it's a good question. But what you want to tell people is, yeah, if someone who believes in, you know, other lives, say, yeah, there is. And, but that's God's life. And God is, God is, you know, God's there. And there's angels and demons and Satan and all that kind of stuff, good and bad. So that needs to be uh, understood. <clears throat> Oh, another great, great questions, by the way. Please explain the day of the Lord, especially the sequence of events in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 to 4. The day of the Lord is a time of judgment of the people here on the earth. It's a period of time. It's not just one day where God will judge. Now, there's a question as to where it starts. Does it start with the rapture of the church, the great tribulation? Does it end with the second coming of Christ? You know, when does it end? Because there's various judgments, even at the end of the millennium. Uh, the point is, you've got human man's day and God's day. Right now we're living in the day of human beings, all right? And we've made a mess of things. Sometime, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, there'll be the day of the Lord, or there is a variant reading actually in the Greek text which says the day of Christ, which means something a little bit different. The day of Christ speaks specifically of the rapture of the church. Some manuscripts read the day of Christ, some read the day of the Lord. So before this day comes, certain things will take place. The, it talks about the departure will come first, the apostasia. Now the question is, most translations read the departure, some of the falling away comes first uh, at the time before, you know, the, um, and then the Antichrist is revealed at that particular time who comes to the temple and claims to be God. Now, if you look at it in sequence, what's really interesting there, the departure that may come first is the rapture of the church. Uh, my good friend Andy Woods has written a book on this subject where he, he, he gives like nine reasons why the departure there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 refers not to a departure from the faith, but the physical departure of believers. Ergo, the rapture of the church. And then the final Antichrist is revealed only after the church is taken out. Because we continue to read in 2 Thessalonians 2, there is a restraining force, there is a restrainer there, keeping this uh, personage from being revealed. And the restraining force can only be one thing, that'd be the Holy Spirit living in the hearts and lives of believers. Because once we're out of here, literally all hell's going to break loose, you know, because people will be left to their own imaginations. There won't be any restraining force on anybody because everybody starts out with one mind, and that is just totally anti-God. Now, the good news is that doesn't last very long because the Holy Spirit will be working again, but he's starting from, you know, ground zero. He's starting from scratch. But many people come to faith in Christ when they see the things taking place, realizing what the Christians have said all this time is correct. And so, um, so that's what Second Thessalonians 2, 1 to 4 says. We could go on and on and on in detail with that. But bottom line is, the sequence of events is that the departure comes first, then the man of sin is revealed. What is the departure? I believe it's the rapture of the church. I don't think it's a physical uh, uh, falling away from the faith. In fact, Paul says in, what is it, verse 5 there in Second Thessalonians 2, Remember I told you this when I was with you? Interesting, he was there in a, for a month in Thessalonica, and he already gave a prophecy talk at the time of the end, and he explained to them that because they were afraid as 1 Thessalonians tells us, that the dead in Christ might not make it. You know, uh, are they at a disadvantage? And that's why in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 says, no, they're not at a disadvantage. They're going to rise first. But then he wanted to clear some other things up, and that's where he talks about the sequence of events, the coming of our Lord, and our gathering together uh, with him. Now, those are two distinct events in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, the coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto him. Two distinct events. Now they could happen at the same time or they could be separated by some time as we believe here. But the bottom line is the Lord is coming for his people, uh, coming for his believers, coming for his saints, the rapture of the church, the dead in Christ rising. Then at another time he will come back with his saints and that is in judgment. Rapture of the church is always a glorious event, joyful. It is the believers going up to meet the Lord. Second coming always has the connotation of judgment, uh, hit, you know, destroying the sinners, setting up God's kingdom. He's coming back to judge in this day of the Lord because it's the time the Lord will judge those here on planet Earth. 
All right, out of time already. I went quick for, on our question and answer session here on our Wednesday edition. Be back tomorrow to do much more. Remember the debate tonight, vice presidential debate. Get that a look, and we'll be back evaluating that tomorrow. Until then, I'm Don Stewart. Thanks for watching, and may the Lord richly, richly bless. Unlocking the End Time Prophetic Puzzle World events continue to point to the near return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Unlocking the End Time Prophetic Puzzle World Event brings together some of today's most sought-after speakers, including Donald Perkins, Ed Henson, Mark Hitchcock, and Don Stewart. This complete DVD set, recorded live, is our exclusive gift this October for any donation of $20 or more. You can help his channel broadcast the good news of Jesus Christ 24 hours a day. Become a family co-laborer today. Yes, you can help us change the lives of the lost. Simply go to hischannel.com, click the donation link, or send your tax-deductible gift to his channel. Post Office Box 25, Santa Ana, California, 92702.